I'm Gerd Leonard, futurist in Zurich, Switzerland. I've been using chatbots a lot for my work. And here's a few things I've learned. First of all, is the anthropomorphization of AI uh, that makes us believe that the bot is real. It's like a person because it has a style. It's like pseudo-conscious. Uh, it's appearing human. It knows me. ChatGPT actually knows who I am. <laughs> it actually pretends to know me misleading human simulations, it makes us believe that this is more than it really is. Designed to appear human. People are falling in love with their chatbots. And they do therapy with the chatbots. And what it means is that we are starting to lose control over who is who and what is what. Bots tend to make you feel like you are better and you are worthy and you already know the answer and you're the smartest and this is good for stroking our ego. It's a psychophantic yay-sayer. This is not our friend. AI is not our friend. AI is a service. And we have to understand this. This is not about friendship. And then we have this issue about ultra-processed information. We have all of the information of the entire internet, every book ever read, and very soon every language ever understood, ultra-processed information that's been compiled and now this giant engine is compressing it down, reducing it to a good answer. It's like ultra-processed food. And that means mostly it's not very full of nourishment. It's just giving us something we need. So we, if we eat fast food or we buy processed food in the supermarket. And when the processed information is presented in such a lively way, in such a human way, in such a completely, shall I say, touching way, personal way, pretending to be pseudo-conscious and to pretending to like me becomes irresistible. This super reductionism. And I think it leads to cognitive outsourcing when we have too much of that speaking on our behalf and giving us answers. So we don't have the 10 magic blue links on Google. You have one definitive answer. And it leads us to application of thinking. And I've noticed by myself that I get tempted to be lazy and say, okay, my YouTube video description, I just do this and it's 90% good, but it's much quicker. Uh, this is a crazy concept that we're going to abdicate our thinking, that we outsource our cognition. A friend, a therapist, you know, like Zuckerberg wants us to get his AI friends and we can trust them. Well, of course, the reality is trust isn't digital. Trust is between people. Trust is about emotions. Trust is about human agency. Trust is about another level of communication. It's about tacit knowledge. It's about all the things that machines know nothing about. And pretending machines can be so powerful because they provide great simulations that are entertaining. And first of all, they enable us to become utterly lazy and to abdicate. And so another concern I have that is that in this sort of black box of AI is that we don't know where it comes from. It compiles it into a very powerful way of saying, oh yeah, make a YouTube video, make Google Notebook at them, we'll make a video for you. So it creates black boxes and systemic blind spots. Copyright status, no, it's irrelevant. Data access rules, irrelevant. Privacy, downstream impact, all of that is irrelevant. It's boiled down to the answer to serve me. Systemic blind spots, I don't want. I don't want ultra-processed information. I don't want black boxes. I want the real stuff, and that's what I want my AI to do. I want it to be competent, not conscious. Offloading cognition is a major issue. AI can do that. Why should I do it? I did the AI can order for me, if I just let them do the work and give them access to my email, my database, my Google Drive, my WhatsApp, my Signal, that is a very bad idea. Because I literally give away everything about me. And that strikes me as a pretty bad deal. Then, of course, we have the issue of bias. We have cultural bias, we have echo chambers, we have missing value alignment. So a data scientist, for example, isn't a woman because 95% of them are men. That is the bias. And so if we run an ad on LinkedIn, it will not show it to women. That's what happened for a long time. One thing you can safely say about chatbots is that they are fluent without fidelity. That means they can give great answers. Chatbots predict the next word, not the next truth. That's concerning because we think the fluidity, the fast-flowing information of chatbots, we think that means that they come from a a point of being convinced, and they speak the truth. The other thing that greatly worries me about chatbots and AI in general is the huge environmental cost that they occur. 
from our queries. Yes, it's getting cheaper and better, but the big tech companies are getting into nuclear power, not the new nuclear power, nuclear fusion, but the old, the fission power, building small-scale nuclear reactors uh, to help run AI data centers. That is going the wrong direction. What are we going to do about this? The other topic, security. When I put stuff into chat GPT, I want to use the memory because I want to be able to go back to what I asked before and connect it all. But if ChatGPT can put this together, and then if I publish my query, when I do the share button, I send it to my colleagues, and I say, look at this conversation I had, then it becomes public. And then the information becomes public. And then if I use an AI agent, who's going to assure trust and security and safety? Huge topic, I think, right now, again, completely unanswered. The fact that the AI sounds like a human does not mean it really understands. This is called interface theater. It's a show, and I think maybe we should not have this much of a show. Maybe we should keep it more stale. We should keep it more machine. We should keep it less like a human because we get confused. And that is a safety issue. That's a social issue. Overuse of AI has been connected to psychosis. This anthropomorphizing, this making the AI into a human, while it's basically not understanding the first thing about being human, it doesn't care, it doesn't feel, it doesn't exist, uh, it is far from human, but nevertheless, we think of it like this because it has fluent language. That is utterly confusing and misleading. Another problem with AI chatbots is model collapse. As the web is filled with information that is not from humans, but with synthetic information, synthetic media, synthetic blog posts, all of that knowledge that's being poured into the system, into the internet, that is not made from humans, it's like a loop effect, right? And we can say this kind of knowledge that spirals down in quality because it's being reinforced by artificial knowledge, by synthetic knowledge. That's a huge issue, a flood of junk food and AI slob that's everywhere. And that worries me. If we get used to the slob, we become information pigs. So this reductionism that we see from the answers of chatbots is that it's boiling down to the most plausible answer, the most agreeable answer with me, and the answer that I will quickly ingest and be impressed by, it, it leads to sort of an automation bias. If we can automate it, it's good. It leads to the idea of, of thinking that we can do without effort, that the effort is spending too much to find out myself, that I shouldn't make the effort to read the book. I shouldn't make the effort to read the keynote. I shouldn't make the effort to go to a conference and listen because it can be automated. The temptation is to automate the knowledge process. There's no such thing. The effort, the chewing, the digesting of information, the percolation inside, all the conversation, that's part of the process. If we cut the process by 90%, we reduce the outcome to less than 2%. That's been my experience. And so this kind of mental atrophy, we wither away with our thinking because the machine has done it for us. It's a huge danger. Application, laziness. It's like cooking. I can't cook in 10 minutes. I'm a hobby cook. Yeah, it takes two hours to go shopping and put it together and create a nice good meal. Should we really boil that down to two seconds because we can take a pill and feel like we're eating?